Nice to see you. I'm fine. Well, Mr. President, nice to see you. Thank you. Oh, it's not working, Dave. Tom Black, Smithsonian, sir. Pleasure. George Groom was President of Peter's Day yesterday. Great to see you. Sorry. Good to see you, Mark Evans.
This matter of the bipartisan committee now is because of that hundred billion that we talked about across a three-year span reductions. About half of that is in the budget we've submitted. We think there could be, if they will sit down with us, and they've been very reluctant not to do that. Uh, today is going to be only the second meeting, and this is something I asked for. Well, actually, I didn't ask what they asked for, and I agreed in the State of the Union address that it was a good idea that we would do this. The, if we can have this, it will start us on a declining pattern, but then we have to face going to work on this very 
structure of government that is built in. In the meantime, when we started, about half of the deficit is is due to the recession, and that is being wiped out simply by the recovery. <coughs> Every day, progress is made there. But if we have total recovery and expansion at all, and everybody at work, that's still going to leave half that deficit, <coughs> which is the fault of the government that has been built up over the last 50 years, the automatic built-in increases. And I have great hopes in the Great Grace Commission's report. We have 2,478 specific recommendations. Now these rec recommendations are based on the findings of probably 1,500 top leaders and people in their fields in business and in institutions and so forth that have looked at government and have approached it from the standpoint of how would business run what they're doing. For example, <coughs> just one little item in there. And I know I was talking about this in the National Potato Circuit 25 years ago. Why should it take an agency of government several times as much money to process an insurance claim for one of our government insurance programs than it does the private insurance industry? How is it so difficult for us to do what is being done out there in the insurance industry every day and find out how they did it? <coughs> and this is what we have to deal with. I'm determined that the deficits have to go. And that's why I say that we should put over our heads, I don't care if they name a spot down the line, which they would have to do several years from now, but we must have a constitutional amendment that requires a balanced budget. We must also, I think, having had this when I was a governor, we should have the line item people. It's an amazing thing that some of the people that up there in the hill can talk about, and now we like to lay the deficits at our door. I refuse to accept it. There is one word in the Constitution that gives the president the right to spend one nickel. Uh, that was the province of the Congress. And those who have been dominant up there for the last 40 odd years, I think, uh, have to take responsibility for this. But the line item veto, they will turn around and reject that because they think it impinges on their rights. But I have a memory in California. I vetoed line item 943 items out of the budget in eight years and was never overridden once. And yet it takes a two-thirds vote of the California, leg the California legislature send the budget back to me in the first place as approved. Then I can go through and line item and they can override it with a two-thirds vote. Never once could they get a two-thirds majority to stand up and defend those particular pork barrel items when they were no longer conceded by the entire budget. And I think it's just necessary for the president. 43 states. I won't answer every question. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> President, uh, your uh, heritage lives on in California, as you know. We recently um, got enough signatures, double the number of signatures required to, to put it on the ballot uh, for the balanced budget in California. I think that'll be the next to the last state, perhaps, is needed before it comes to the federal government. Anyway, your uh, your good record lives on. I think we were all impressed last night uh, in your uh, all and the other comments on the opportunity that exists with Russia now and the report from uh, Vice President Bush. And uh, I'm just wondering how you look upon this opportunity that has come about by retaining leadership in Russia. Well, I know it's premature at this point to say that a man who's been in the old bureau and part of the institution governing Russia for this long might take different courses, and yet we can't ignore the things that he said uh, to George. We can't ignore his expression of wanting to find an answer to a nuclear threat. Uh, said that he wanted to find out if there wasn't some way that we could control regional wars so they could not endanger uh, the world. Things of that kind, and I'm very ready. I have long said that get in trouble talking about each other instead of to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, uh, we're discussing right now how to go about this without uh, giving them an opportunity to snub us if we move in the wrong, in the wrong manner. But I think it's high time. I, 
I won't give up. I know this is fantastic. Maybe we can do it. I can't help but believe that it's a superpower to get together and honestly look at the whole matter of nuclear weapons. It's possible that we could recognize that both of us would be better off if we got rid of them entirely. I can't conceive of a world that goes on down through the generations to come with that threat hanging over me. But it has to be mutual. Right. Uh, what do you think the likelihood would be of uh, actually pulling out of UNESCO? Uh, I think there's about a one year window which we declared uh, prior to that. And I have a, I guess a second question. In terms of freedom of the press, are there some, is there a role that you feel that publishers might be able to play in assisting you? Uh, in the advocacy of the freedom from press, and particularly relative to the new world of information concepts that they come through UNESCO. Well, I'll take UNESCO first and simply say, if in this year, if they're serious enough to clean up some things that really have needed cleaning up for a long time, <coughs> fine, we, we would reconsider. If not, then it offers no hope for any of us, and certainly, uh, you had ideas that would restrict you. Your freedom is a, a great deal. So this was done after long years of trying to get them to clean up. And now the other matter of <coughs> with the free press here and what, uh, what could be done, you realize that you opened yourselves up to a possible assault. <laughs> 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 We accept. <laughs> no, there, there are, there are some things that I, I just wonder, and I respect very highly the freedom of the press, and I go along with Jefferson that if I had to choose between government or a free press, uh, I'd choose a free press. But I wonder sometimes, and probably this is more has more to do with the actual news uh, section of the press. If there hasn't been a falling away of a sense of responsibility on the part of the media for its part in preserving our national security, preserving all that uh, is essential to that, what I'm thinking of are those leaked stories, and I have found out Washington is a sieve not a city. <laughs> but so many times, the leakers may hinge on a little bit of fact, but then the conclusions that they present are their own thinking. And how many times those are destructive to something that we're honestly trying to accomplish here. To, to see something printed that is absolutely not true, uh, based on un named White House source and then find yourself on the phone with the head of state of another country, a friend and ally of ours, trying to square something because their embassies see that they get all this information that appears in our press and to try and say to them, look, it isn't true. Uh, we didn't do it. And I just wonder sometimes if the press, with one of these sources that won't <coughs> allow their names to be used, if they couldn't pick up a phone and check and then hear our side, at least ask and say, would this be harmful and why? And if we could feel free to say back, yes it would and here's why. Uh, I think we're going on. Uh, this has been particularly true in things like the, the Lebanon situation where for this year and a half, We've had three excellent ambassadors, one after the other. We burned them out. Uh, Habib, Lennon Farland, and now Don Rumsfeld. Shuttling over there between Damascus and Tel Aviv and, and uh, Beirut. We're dealing with these various factions and trying to get them to uh, begin to come together on this consensus type government that they need in Beirut. And then spending half their time in trying to correct some of this apprehension that's been created by this. And 
That's my one, one main criticism. And other than that, to, as I told the working daily press out there, that with regard to another Grenada incident, I will make sure that there are the first landing barges here. <laughs> <laughs> winner 
in nuclear war, there must never be Uh, you made reference uh, last night on television to the Grace Commission. You made reference again a few minutes ago. Uh, I'm curious as to uh, what exactly uh, the steps you're taking to look through those 2,000 odd recommendations that have been put on the table. What kind of a staff is working on trying to implement some of those? Now, on the Grace Commission report. Yes. Yeah, what we, kind of staff? We, we have we have that in the hands of our people here and dividing it up into the various agencies. And then we have a system that is new with us. Around this table gathers the cabinet for regular cabinet meetings, but also, more frequently, like this afternoon, uh, there will be what we call a cabinet council meeting. And that will be a meeting on a particular subject where those cabinet members that have a direct involvement in that particular subject will be present along with staff and department heads and so forth. And we, the other cabinet members won't be there because <coughs> it does not treat with anything of their particular interest. And this, that process will be one that we will get to with regard to these specific recommendations as the agencies deal with them. But believe me, we're going to take it seriously because I have the opportunity to see it work in California. We did this. We asked a group of the private sector to come up with the 64 government agencies and departments and come back and tell us how private business practices could be put to work. And we implemented more than 1,600 of their 2,000 recommendations. You, you feel Oh, I'm sorry. Whichever way you want to. You feel it then. I'll feel that. Give you a chance to be over here, sir. Yes. Yes, I, I have two questions, Mr. President. The first one is, uh, is one of the uh, means by which you keep your excellent health to meet with this number of people uh, daily and therefore not uh, have the opportunity to digest your meal properly. <laughs> the second one is uh, I saw on this morning's uh, television that Mr. Philbrick in New Hampshire has put your name on the ballot the Democratic primary, and I wonder how you'll do in that uh, election. Right, <laughs> 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 right, and vote. Yeah, yeah, right. And they run <laughs> this is Mr. Kubrick, who was uh, uh, pr uh, last year, I believe, was Senator Kennedy's right. uh, campaign manager in New Hampshire. Yes, yeah, so I was uh, promoting your name for right out. They, they want them to write right in of all conservative Democrats to write your name in to see how many more vote for you than for some of the other candidates. I'm sure this isn't just going to be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. The gentleman seems to be. You'll probably win this. <laughs> I can remember in California when you used to be able to run on both tickets. And, and, uh, and uh, then there were so many Republican governors that the Democrats changed. Mr. President, following up on the Grace Commission, uh, the other day I was at a conference of chief executives and Peter Grace was there and presented it. And uh, my early impression was that he used kind of a superficial the press releases didn't give too much attention. I was overwhelmed by as I think well, most of our people were, and I was overwhelmed by Peter Grace himself and the dynamics that he has. The question in my mind, since much of it was bipartisan, is do you think you can manage to both keep a bipartisan thing behind that, uh, in other words, keep it somewhat out of the political areas that still have efficiency in government, or just because you do something, credit it, and get credit for it, the administration will let down the rest of it to uh, balance. Well, well, I know there's going to be partisanship, of course, on anything regarding less spending. But no, I think the same approach that what we'll try to do is we come together on this, then is bring Congress down here or go up there, I mean, certain leaders in there, and uh, see if we can't put together the same kind of an operation we did with regard to the Social Security bailout when it was facing bankruptcy. Now, they were part of the ship. 82, they made it an issue, they, they started on the position entirely. When the election was over, we got together in a bipartisan commission, and present on that commission were some of 
the opposition that said we were lying when we said the program would go broke by July of 83, we didn't do something. Well, around the table, they agreed it would go broke. <laughs> the election was over by then. So, uh, no, we'll, we'll have to do that same thing. We will implement everything we can by administrative procedure, but I know that a great deal of it will take legislation. <coughs> We, there are things that they found in there that you just wonder about, in which the Congress <coughs> has absolutely dictated the number of people that must work uh, at a certain task, in a job. <coughs> and here you are as the executive branch then to run that, and you come in and say, hey, we could run this with half the number of people. <coughs> but Congress has said, you've got to use them all. <coughs> and uh, these are the type of things that we've got to get them to. The staggering Volpe's statement was the effect that they have spent a great deal of time, used every government agency there was to try and find out how many government offices of all kinds are there in the United States and to this day they do not know or even have a good approximation, he said. <laughs> you remember, you remember that when World War II broke out, now you know the level of aircraft construction at that time, the high interest rates and deficits, uh, I don't think the high interest rates are tied to deficits. Let me make that point. I think the <coughs> I think the high interest rates are still with us because after seven previous recessions since World War II and the artificial answers that we found to them, which only led to another recession, I think it's just that out there in the money market, they're not sure that we really are serious about it and have control of inflation. And so once they understand that we are, I think we're going to begin seeing those come down. There's no need for them to be where they are. On the deficits, yes, we've got to get control of the deficits. I think, I think this next one or two, doing what we're doing now uh, is survivable. But what we have to have by that time and then for the out years is a projected decline to where we can see the end of it up ahead. And if not, yes, I think that could cause trouble if they, we can't go on just spending at an ever increasing rate above uh, what we take in. I think also, and I'd almost like to say this is off the record, uh, my own feeling about this and the argument about tax increase. I don't think tax increase is the answer down to the deficit problem. They've had tax increases back over the last 50 years, and we've had deficit spending for 50 years, and no one even mentioned it. It was just taken for granted as part of the regular policy. All that, all that increased taxes do is increase spending. People then feel free to come through with more uh, additional programs. And so, but there is a chance. If, suppose when we get recovery, suppose this recovery continues, and, we go into that, well, I've had one national economist write me and tell me to stop saying recovery, that we're past that point, that this is now legitimate expansion that we're in. But <coughs> suppose we have a full recovery where we can look and say, all right, now our estimate of revenues is based on good, full employment, <coughs> prosperity of the kind that we've known in the past. If you can say that, and you've done all that you can do to bring government down to the most efficient, most economic, and then the share of gross national product that government is spending is bigger than the share that the tax revenues are bringing in. Then I think you would have to look and say, okay, since we've got full recovery at all, we, evidently our tax structure is not returning enough for this, and this is what we all agree is the minimum for government, then we would have to bring the tax structure up to that point. We think that we might be bringing it up some with what we're asking the Treasury Department to do during this interim, and that is to review the whole tax structure from the standpoint of simplification and to review how we can have a tax structure that can get at that great amount of tax that is lost to us now uh, through people that are just resisting by way of barter and all of these. We estimate, we, we cut the deficit in half right now if we were getting the taxes that were legitimately owed to us. And the people are debating because, and it's happened in every society before, when people begin to think that the government is unfair 
that the taxes are a greater burden than they should be. People, even honestly, they wouldn't steal a dime otherwise. Feel the government is fair game, and if they could reduce their taxes by some device, they'll do it. Mr. President, I assume were those comments off the record or on the record? Well, <laughs> well, this is one of those things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I wouldn't want to see someone put a headline. The president says would raise taxes if, <laughs> and uh, then come out and look like I'm. I've got my heels dug in on that. I think the worst thing that we could do right now with regard to our recovery and economic situation would be to raise taxes. In the first place, there is a tax increase built in, and we didn't do it. And that is the tax increase on Social Security that is built in that was passed, I, I guess, back in about 77, and there are still further increases to be made and further increases between now and 1990 on the amount of money subject to the tax. Do you remember that pamphlet that Social Security put out in 1937 that they promised that the people will never pay more than 3% of $3,000 of earnings <laughs> and that that money will be invested and thus will be earning more revenue to add to it so they will get more back than they paid in? Well, now it's aiming at the final tax will be 15% <clears throat> employer and employee on more than $60,000 of income. This is a far bigger tax for most of the workers in the country now than the income tax, and still increasing. Yes, sir. Mr. President, why do you think the uh, stock market has gone down as it has in the last week or so? Well, a very knowledgeable individual about the stock market warned me about this, yeah. and he gave me a very simple warning as to why. He said, with the interest rates where they are, the spread between the return on bonds and the return on equities is so great that money is going to be diverted into the bonds as long as this remains. And he even gave me a pretty good approximation of what has happened, and to the extent that it's happened, and how much the market would go down, and how quickly. And it's happened, so I have to. He's one of the few economists that uh, has been right. You're going to tell us how much he said it would go down. <laughs> <laughs> he, he suggested that, uh, and he did not say that this was the limit, but he said we could expect 100 to 150 points that he was sure of. Mm -hmm. There's one under the clock there. Mr. President, you were question rather sharply by two network correspondents last night about your alleged inattention to uh, your job. Uh, aside from denying what you did last night, how do you think you can counteract this perception? Well, I don't know whether I can counteract it. You know, you can't win an argument with somebody who buys newspaper pulp by the ton. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the I don't know where this came from. Well, well, they used to say it. Well, yes, I do know where it came from. One correspondent who was from Sacramento and we used to cover the state, they said the same thing about me as a governor out there. And uh, I did the things that had to be done. And I'll tell you, though, I've, I've always believed in the executive that things he has to put in 18 hours a day, seven days a week, isn't a very good executive. And I have always believed in designating and, and uh, giving others responsibility. But I do, as I said last night, I make the decisions. They come to me. And I don't, all these uh, things of taking off and going home, and I really mean it, but my evenings are spent with homework that comes home from the office with the reports and the things that have to be read and that there's no time at the office but to do it. And uh, I just, I don't know how, except that the only thing I say is let's go by the results. We said we'd reduce taxes, and we said we would reduce inflation, and we said we would cut the regulations, and, uh, and we've done all those things and are doing them. And uh, somebody must have been telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Burton, the, uh, the highest office is a tough job. Why'd you decide to go after it again? job isn't finished. And when I think of 
how much we've accomplished that for three years now or more, the argument here in Washington has been over how much to cut, not over what new programs and how much we will increase spending to fund those. I just don't want to see us go back uh, to that other way. I think we've made quite a start. I want to finish the job. Mr. President, we, we discussed with Mr. McFarland <coughs> this morning the apparent misunderstanding on the part of a lot of American people that that America has the capability of taking Russia out right now. <coughs> and wonder why we have to match weapon after weapon. One thing I didn't quite understand, which you could clarify for me, is it our policy that we would, if, even if we were attacked, that we would respond only against military targets? <clears throat> this has been originally in the MAD policy, mutual assured destruction. The theory was that uh, you blow up our cities, we blow up yours. Actually, I think on both sides there has been a change. We know that their weapons are targeted on ours, and uh, with the idea that they would retain a second strike capability, so that having destroyed our weapons, then they could say to us, if you shoot yours, we'll wipe out all these cities. And uh, ours are based on theirs, also destroying theirs. And I think that's the way it should be. Some of us are here old enough to remember when the rules of warfare uh, contained all kinds of protections for the civilians, that they weren't the targets in the war. And I wonder if we realize how far we've strayed from that civilized viewpoint now to where people talk about weapons that are particularly aimed at destroying the civilians. I'd like to get back to the civilization. I remember when I was in college one night in the fraternity house, somebody came to the campus and made a speech about bombers and bombs. This was after World War I. And the debate that was raging was that we were all determined that even if he was ordered to, no American would drop bombs on civilians. And uh, <clears throat> World War II, somebody invented tour of war. Those that invented it after they were defeated said, well, they invented it, we made it work. Uh, I, I'd like to get back to where we would all think that uh, we wouldn't shoot at the unarmed civilians. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, back to tax reform for just a minute. Would you give us your comments on the flat tax? Yes, I can give you one that we've, we've had some samples presented to us already for our discussions here. And uh, we found out that that very simple tax, <coughs> as a matter of fact, we thought it looked like a simple, obvious answer. One week of the Treasury Department to show us where just about triple the burden of people at the lower levels of the economy. And uh, we discovered that we didn't talk flat tax. We've got an awful lot of study to do and to make it work and to not create more problems than we solve. Thank you. Mr. President, how do you account for your uh, lack of support by women, according to the opinion board? Well, now, I, I challenge the premise of the talk there, the gender gap, and maybe some of the ladies present should answer this. But the truth is, it's almost an even split. <coughs> there is some advantage of the other side of women, but by the same token, I could ask them, how do they explain the preponderance of male vote that I get? So the gender gap works both ways. The, I think it comes, basically, from the organized feminist groups and the fact that I have opposed, in principle, the Equal Rights Amendment. As governor, I didn't have any quarrel with that at all. Until it came before the state of California and as a governor, I realized that I had to make a decision. And so I set out to learn all I could, study it, and what I learned convinced me that it is not the cure. At some point. It would take away from the legislature the things that it should be doing and turn it over to courts. And the 
woman who thinks that she would be absolutely protected by this amendment would find she'd be protected if she was ready to take the case to court, uh, if she thought it was discrimination, that the Constitution was being violated. So what I just didn't seem to satisfy some as governor, we set up a program in which we started surveying all the statutes of California and all the regulations and eliminating any where there was discrimination. And I was amazed at some of the things that we found. But still in this modern day in California, there was a law in the books that said that a wife could not invest her own money without her husband's permission. And, uh, we changed all those things. And that's why when I got here, I immediately contacted the 50 governors and got their agreement to set up and have a representative in their states to do the same thing, their state level, <coughs> that we did in ours. Most of the laws that affect people are at the state level. Now we're doing that with the federal laws. And we're even nitpicking. We are even taking up laws and are going to seek changes in laws that will only require the change of one word. That maybe there's a word in there that says if a man does such a, we'll say person, so that no one can use even that slight thing as to use this law in a discriminatory way. And I think that there's getting to be some recognition in our own administration of what we have done, the appointment to high places, three in our cabinet, there have never been that many uh, before. Supreme Court justice, there has never been that before, but more than that, we have a, a thousand, more than a thousand women in high policy making positions in the administration. And uh, I think we're just gonna have to keep living away at it. And I think we are making some gains as they recognize what we're doing particularly in the things we did in the tax reform. We reduced and intend to eliminate the marriage penalties. We have almost doubled the tax credit for working mothers for child care. Uh, we have eliminated the, the uh, inheritance tax for surviving spouses, which is the greatest thing we could do with regard to the family-owned farm, the family-owned business that uh, present uh, what we've had before that is a situation where a surviving spouse would have to sell the farm or the business in order to pay the inheritance tax, particularly when values have gone up so much under inflation. All of these things, I think they will find uh, we're on their side. Down here, yes, sir. Mr. President, I had the privilege of being in Japan last November when you were there. And I'm uh, curious, as you look into the future of the forthcoming China trip, what would be the focal point of the uh, trip to China, slated for early April or something like that? <coughs> well, to just further bring together the, the gains that we've made regarding the trade, uh, tighten this friendship, uh, proceed further with uh, student exchanges, cultural exchanges, and that sort of thing. Uh, there were some things that have been left undone a little bit. And uh, because I had made the decision when I came here and they were, the invitation was already there, but I thought that we had gone there too much without their coming here. And they seemed to put a certain face value on me, that, that if you go there, it indicates that maybe you're coming hand in hand. And so I said, I'll go there after they come here. <laughs> so we issued an invitation, and finally he came, and so I will return the visit. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, as a follow-up to a question that I raised with the economy this morning, I was not going to bribe the Board of Economists, and it's most re recently, at the end of 83, concluded that given the high rate of unemployment among black teenagers, uh, specifically blacks in general, that uh, there was indeed a crisis in black America that uh, needed to be looked at in terms of the unemployment rate. Uh, this morning, Dick indicated that uh, the enterprise zone was one area he hoped that uh, would be solving some of the problem, but acknowledged it was a long-term solution. I just wondered if there were any more specific things that are in the near term uh, would point to with solving uh, the unemployment problem among teenagers and among black uh, persons in general. Well, 
I can say this, that in the recovery, the, not substantially so, but the decrease in unemployment is greater among black workers and women uh, than it is among adult and white males. So, so the present recession picture uh, does not give us exactly what the, the balance will be, but I know what we can all do that they are big enough and they have a higher rate of unemployment. Particularly, is this true with teenagers? And here, maybe you could all be of help. I have a belief, very profound belief, that we have created much of that good unemployment with the minimum wage. <coughs> I remember as governor, a group of young black students who wanted to see me as governor and went out with the governor's summer jobs and things of that kind. And they, they were smart enough to realize what, what this was, and they asked me to see if I would try to take the lead in trying to get that minimum wage change. The kind of jobs that young people with no job skill get, particularly summer and after school jobs, have been priced out of the market. And at least if we're going to have a minimum wage, then let's have a, a two step wage that represents the uh, there is a different price in the money for beginners. The reason I mention students is the fact that we have to face that 47.5% of the unemployed youth in America are at the same time students. So I, it's a shame that they have to be lumped in and averaged in with the regular unemployment rate. That highest unemployment, these are really kids that are going to school. And since you're determined unemployed on the basis of whether you are looking for or want a job, I've never known a kid in school, going back to when I was that wasn't wishing they had an after school job or a weekend job, summer job. But we've made it so difficult. When I was 14 years of age, I got my first summer job. It was with an outfit that was buying old houses, remodeling them and reselling it. And before the summer was over, I started with a pick and shovel uh, with this. Before the summer was over, I laid hardwood floor, I shingled roof, I painted those houses. Today, we've got so many rules and regulations. No young person could do that. We be denied the right to do those things. And uh, I, I think that we ourselves with regulations with this minimum wage, that would be one. But the, I do believe that the enterprise zones uh, would be a major factor in that because the incentive is not only for the investment the capital in those zones of business to win there, there is an incentive for them to take people that presently are unemployed, people who are on welfare, who are not working, and make them productive citizens. I think we're covering the lead in manufacturing in areas such as steel, in the auto industry, and so forth, that we once enjoyed would make a substantial difference. Yes, although I wonder if some of those industries are ever going to be able to recover all of the market that they lost. We know steel. I think it's significant that steel in Japan, which is one of the big threats to our own steel industry, they have now pulled back from any further pushing of steel because they can't compete with the newly developing countries and their pay scale. We're coming in Korea, Taiwan, places, that kind of delivery in the steel market. Incidentally, I happen to believe that the hope that the Justice Department will not pursue that antitrust activity with regard to the request of mergers. I don't think those mergers are going to reduce competition and benefit the consumer in any way. But Youth. The, the history of the minimum wage, <coughs> if you will go back before the minimum wage, you will find that the rate of unemployment among white teenagers was less than among black teenagers. Probably because more black teenagers wanted jobs. But then with the passage of the minimum wage, and every increase on up, you will see a proportionate increase in unemployment every time we've raised the minimum wage, and particularly among women.
Mr. President, your Job Training Partnership Act is, is uh, <coughs> also an important initiative in terms of the unemployment uh, oh, situation. Yes. <coughs> there is a page of the site passed and put into effect a job training program at the same time we were turning down a lot of proposals for other things. <coughs> this one is going to be, the bulk of the money is going not for administration, but it's going for training. It's going to be administered at the local level by a combination of not only local authorities, but also the business community, industrial community, to teach in that area what are the job needs and the job vacancies in that area and train people for those jobs. Instead of having these blanket programs that trained a lot of people and turned them out and there weren't any jobs available and the things that they've been trained for. So we think that will also be a direct help. Uh, Mr. President, the Sandinistas are, have announced elections and Cubans are supposed to be leaving Nicaragua. Do you take this as a sign of improvement in Latin America? Just one second here, I think. You see, I do make the decisions. <laughs> 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 that does argue for your work day also. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. President, the Sandinistas have announced elections and the Cubans are supposed to be leaving Nicaragua. Do you take this as a sign of improvement in the situation in Latin America? Well, it shows, I think, that they're listening and they're trying to do something. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to prove with the details surrounding that. Are they going to remove censorship of the press so that competing candidates can have a fair chance? Is it going to be a legitimate election or not one of those kind where you vote yes or no and if you vote no, you go to jail? Uh, so we want to watch very carefully. How far are they willing to go to keep their promises that they made during the revolution that they wanted <coughs> human rights and they wanted democracy and they wanted uh, open markets and all that sort of thing? So I don't think that we should just jump. I think we should stand here and make sure that they meet all the terms of a legitimate open election. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Bill, yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, your position with our allies, I think, I, I certainly personally admire, particularly holding uh, the fire to the tails of uh, West Germany and England last uh, fall in deployment. Of the missiles. I'm wondering how you view Japan and its uh, ally role in meeting some of the increased obligations in the military sense that our country is requesting. We are greatly encouraged. I think the Prime Minister Nagasone is a different breed than what we've done business with before. He really believes that we is probably the two most potent democracies in the, or industrial powers, I should say, in the free world need to be closer together. Now, he's got some political problems with some of the things that we like to have him do. But I have to say, he's taken them up. And we've made great progress. And we have a team working with their administration with their people right now. And he really is doing his utmost to meet the, the things that we brought up. One of the most important, and I think, in all of our relationships, is the value of the yen. It is undervalued and he is, and he is prepared to take steps to bring that up more. You're familiar with the Japan California Association. I'm getting some real strong playback from industry leaders in that group in Japan, how much they support him and what he's doing, and I think that's very encouraging. Good. Good credit Good. to you. Right, maybe we can have one final question from Bill Gore. President um, Mr. President, frequently businessmen come to Washington and complain about government, and I think we'd like to go on record as an association um, about the marvelous job that the Postmaster General is doing with the Postal Service. Uh, I think we all beat on, on bureaucracy and beat on the government, but the uh, Postal Service has 100,000 fewer people than they did 10 years ago, and productivity has really skyrocketed. And uh, we just want you to know that we think that businessmen that use that 
best service in the United States, but uh, you've done a fine job. Uh, we'd also like to ask you to uh, ask Mr. Arrington to try to find a really top-notch businessman to the vacancy on the Postal Board of Governors. We, uh, we'd love to have a, a knowledgeable person in that, in that uh, vacant slot. And, uh, several gentlemen have been suggested that we uh, highly recommend We'd love to see that. Well, I can tell you we're taking that very seriously, and there are some good men in the case of choosing which among them, and uh, we feel as you do about that. No one has told you. I take it very seriously. The only thing I've got against the Postmaster General is he killed an awful lot of good jokes that I had about mail delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, I, I would ask you to comment a little bit on the Lebanese or the Middle East situation, then, if you don't mind, but particularly in relation to what the, the Saudis are now proposing as a current solution uh, between the Syrians and the Lebanese. The, this seems to be a big, in answer to a demand of the Syrians. I'm not sure that uh, he's covering all the points in there. And I'm not, uh, last night I asked that question about our Marines and so forth, and found out I'd taken six minutes in the answer, which I can't take here. Um, I just, I'm, I think that I'm very critical of Syria. There's no question they've got their own ambitions and their territorial ambitions and what they're trying to accomplish. I still think the answer would be if these various factions within Lebanon could come together as they tried to win the Geneva meetings that they had. <coughs> and have a government in which every sector is, is fairly represented. The, one of the, the troubles, there's no we might as well face it, is that back their laws from the beginning, in the setup of their government, it dictated that a minority group, the Maronite Christians, would dominate government more than the others. And you have a situation in which the majority of the country now has <coughs> smaller representation. And I think there was a reluctance on the part of the existing government to persecution number of people in that area. Which, that thing that I just proved here was the fact that I have to get out of here and go to a meeting on something that has to be decided about Lebanon <laughs> right now. And uh, I can't answer to what that is because they didn't tell me. They just said, can we have a meeting? <laughs> I better go and have that meeting. <coughs> Is, uh, the, we have to face this one thing. Now, some of the criticism about whether we should use more force and more muscle. This all starts with our wanting to help bring about an overall Middle East peace between the Arab nations and the Israelis. We know that anything that we are portrayed as being uh, on the side of a faction and opposed to Syria, we would lose much of what we've gained right now in trust and friendship with the Arab nations. They would come together because we were in opposition to an Arab state. So we're limited this time. As to flexing muscle and so forth, we flex it a little bit to let them know that we protect our men. And uh, I must say we found out that there's a great deal of psychology in those 16 inch guns up in New Jersey. <laughs> Policies were changed very quickly once they heard them that go off, saw the result. But uh, we're still going to hang in there as long as there is a chance, as I said last night, that we can help bring it up with you. If we don't, what do we have? We have Syria, which has been at war five times with Israel, with unimpeded access to that northern border of Israel. I think the possibility of war is, cannot be denied. And uh, I know this isn't going to influence any of my decisions, but I wonder do any of you know that in the Old Testament and the prophecies about Armageddon, it says they begin with the storming of the gates of Damascus. <laughs> Anyone ready for that yet? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, 
we appreciate your time, and we know that there were a couple of these gentlemen who uh, we really didn't get a picture of, so as you're standing at the door, if perhaps we could take Fine. another picture of each of you, we have an opportunity very quickly as we go out. Maybe starting with Bill Lee.